All right. Okay, this should have been where we got up to. Basically, uh, Andrew Jackson getting ripped out of the election and going to Adams. Correct? Yeah? Nine? Right? Yes? No? Maybe so? All right, we're going on. The new man in politics. Now, I'll tell you right now, this new guy that we're talking about is not the guy who became the president. John Quincy Adams. It's not him. Indeed, oh, come on. Why don't y'all tell me, Professor Galloway, it's not with you. Okay, Adam's troubled administration. Now, almost from the get-go, uh, Adam seemed to have it all going for him. I mean, he was the son of President John Adams, he'd been a diplomat, a U.S. Senator, a Harvard professor, a Secretary of State. So it seemed like he had the political pedigree, but he was not popular at all. He seemed very cold and impersonal. He refused to use political patronage to build support. Political patronage means like, hey, Renee was there, he helped me get elected, so I'm going to help you by giving you a political office. And you're going to give underneath you to your staffers that support you, that in turn support me, you're going to give them all jobs. I thought that that was a bad, undemocratic thing. So I keep him in the office, even though he voted against me. And he was against me. I thought, you know what, that's part of democracy. Well, maybe it wasn't. And his policies didn't appear to have the interests of the common man at heart. I mean, he increased tariffs, so things cost people more. Now, if, you're, if they're protective tariffs, you think, hey, maybe that's great. Well, no, because basically the little guy's paying for the big guys, the fat cats. He gave out big loans to manufacturers. Indeed, he passed so many high tariffs on so many things that they kind of uh, added them almost to get all together and they called them the tariff of abominations. Basically, it's a hodgepodge of tariffs that he passed. And guys, almost everybody You know, even if you supported some of the tariffs on other things, you may have liked stuff that a tariff was put on. Now, you know what? You know what frustrates me as a male teacher? People who put their phones down in their laps on their seats. I shouldn't be looking in that direction at my students. So I'll ask all my students who have placed their phones there, and I know who you are, to please don't place them there and take them away as following the school policy. Right, Ron? Right, Ron. Democratic styles and political structures. Now, guys, political participation here in America actually becomes more democratic from 1800 to 1830 by that. What do I mean? I mean more people get the right to vote. Property requirements are eliminated. You know, everybody used to think, oh, all, all white men could... No! You had to have land. Well, by the 1830s, it's okay if you don't have land. And now, instead of just having the state legislatures vote for the president, we've realized it's okay to give the common man the right to vote for their electoral college rep representative, who in turn is going to turn around and vote for the president. Ready 
Now, during this time that you're letting more people take part in voting, you're having more political parties rising up. Like in New York, Martin Van Buren pioneered in the organization of disciplined local organizations. Basically, he took a bunch of disaffected Republican Democrats and he started calling them the Bucktail Faction. Others in New York organized the Anti-Masonic Party. Now, do y'all know what a Masonic organization is? Y'all know who the Masons are? Basically, it's an all-boys club where only men are allowed membership. Usually, they're like the Elks Lodge is one of them. Uh, can't think of the Grand Oak Leaves and everything that we got in here. But basically, it's a society that men go to. And, oh, the Shiners, the Shriners, they're a Masonic organization, a fraternal organization. Now, of course, wives can go, but they can't be members. Um, but anyway, a lot of people thought that basically Masons were in control of everything and they were nothing but bad. And what led them to believe this? Well, you had the case of William Morgan, who was, not only was a Mason, but in real life he was a Mason. He was a bricklayer. Well, he had uh, compiled a book of some of the secrets of the Masons, and he was going to have these lesser-known secrets published. And anyway, as he was walking to the printer, he walked across City Hall, the City Hall property, and he stepped on the grass. Well, of course, you can't step on the grass. So he gets arrested, um, asked to pay the $2.96 fine, for walking on the grass. Nobody walks around with that kind of mad money with him, so he can't pay them, and he gets thrown in jail. Then all of a sudden, at about midnight, the jailer comes, unlocks the door, and says, your bail's been paid. He walks out of the jail confused, and all of a sudden, two hooded and cloaked figures grab him, throw him into a stagecoach, and whisk him away. And he was never heard from again. Well, really, you want me to tell you the rest of the story? Until six months later, everybody thought he was gone. Then they found a body on the other side of the lake that was eviscerated. His body, had, because like if you break Masonic secrets in the oath, you say, may my body be torn from, you know, in this kind of fashion where I'll be flayed. That's what happened to the body. They called in Miss uh, Morgan, and they said, is this your husband? And she looked at it, and she said, yes, yes, that's my husband. And that's where the story ends. Or you want me to tell you where it really is? Where it really ends, two weeks later, she goes back into the cops, and she says, you know what, I, I don't think that was my husband. And that's where the story, well, you want to know where the story really ends? And then, about three months after that, rumors started drifting back to where William Morgan, the village he lived in, that there was a guy that looked just like William Morgan living on the other side of the lake who'd taken up a new wife. Anyway, what we do know is, is that uh, you did have the um, anti-Masons that were out there. Oh, and I couldn't find an image of them on the internet. So was that a Masonic conspiracy? Them trying to keep the truth down? And it's into this that we have the rise of King Andrew. In 1826, Martin Van Buren organized the Democrat Party. I told you that he was taking the disaffected Republican Democrats and they were calling themselves the Buckdale Faction. Well, now... He calls them the Democrat-Republicans. See what he did there? We're not the Republican-Democrat, we're the Democrat. And anyway, they finally just dropped the Republican parts, and bada bing, bada boom, it's the Democratic Party. Same Democratic Party we have today. Um, basically, you've got a coalition of political leaders that equally represented the North, the South, and the West. They threw their support to the political candidate that had received votes from all those different regions, the North, the South, and the West. And it should come as no surprise that Jackson, 
soundly defeated Adams in the 1828 elections. Now, who was this crazy cat known only as Andrew Jackson? Did everybody get the last slide? Everybody get the last slide? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> who was this crazy cat? Well, uh, Jackson was kind of the frontiersman, frontiersman. His dad died two weeks before he was born, and his mom three days. Always, nobody ever catches me on that. No, his mom survived. But his dad did die two weeks before he was born. And this guy's living out in the backwoods, Tennessee, okay, trying to hack out a life uh, with his family. At the age of 13, he fought in the Revolutionary War, uh, where he was uh, captured. He escaped, and after his escape, his 14-year-old brother tells 13-year-old Andy, hey, you're too young. You need to go back home and take care of mom. So he goes back home, out in Tennessee. While uh, the, a squad of British were coming, redcoats, because we're all British until we win the uh, revolution, uh, a squad of redcoats came by. It had been raining earlier in the day. Their boots were muddy. You know, Andy Jackson, you know, 14, 15 at this time, teenage boy. A British soldier comes in there, makes, their, uh, makes his mom fix them some. And he tells Andy, hey, kid, come here and clean my boots. And Andy Jackson kindly told him not only where he could put his boots, but that he wasn't going to clean them. And this so enraged the British soldier that he pulled out his sword and he brought it down on Andy. I mean, he was going to kill Andy Jackson. Andy Jackson blocked himself with his arm. The sword went down to the bone, then hit his jaw, went down to the bone, and he collapsed from loss of blood. Um, and basically he carried with him that scar for the remainder of his life. Uh, after the revolution, however, he continues on. Um, he uh, became a lawyer, as well as the first senator of Tennessee, a uh, judge on the Tennessee Supreme Court. His military exploits gave him the name Old Hickory. And now that he's elected president, it's the first time that someone west of the old elite coast and that the first time a member of another political, true political party took office. Now, guys, you want to hear the story behind this? This is uh, Jackson Square in New Orleans. And that's kind of weird to have a military um, hero quaffing his hat like that. Do you know what the legend is behind why uh, he's quaffing his hat? And this was during Jackson's lifetime. You have Jackson Square. Here's uh, Jackson's statue. And there's all these stores and everything, church, all these stores and everything that go around the square. And they wanted to erect a uh, statue of Andy Jackson in honor of and what he did for New Orleans. Now right here is a house of ill repute, a uh, bordello, a cat house. Uh, basically where ladies of the evening were. And um, they went around to all the places, hey, we're taking up this collection, they're taking up this collection, we're taking up this collection, and everybody was giving them money. And the, the madam of the boudoir, the cat house, said, oh, I'll give y'all money. I'll give y'all some money for this. And they said, no, we don't accept, we only accept money from ladies and gentlemen. We will not accept money from you. So they said, okay. But then at the end of the drive, they didn't have the money they needed. So they go back, cap in hand, to the madam. Excuse me, ma'am. We'll, we'll take your money now. And the woman said, oh, really? 
Well, I'll give you the money on one condition. That you have Andy Jackson on his statue, tip his hat to the ladies, as a gentleman does for a lady. Because this statue is directly facing the cat house. So, being a gentleman to the ladies, and they needed the money, they said, okay, we'll do it. And that's why we have that curious statue there. Well, guys, oh man, uh, this, this was Trump way before there was Trump. I mean, this is the common man. This is the you and me. People are going crazy. Uh, basically, um, he walked down the streets inviting people to the White House. People, had ne the White House hadn't been open to the public before Andy Jackson. He's like, hey, come on, come on, party. There's going to be a huge barbecue. And, oh, the citizens who'd never been in there, they all come in. They had a huge party. And of course, they caused more than $250,000 worth of damage. They stole silverware. But it was the first time that the common man had been let in. I mean, this is Andy Jackson. Like I told you, he's the first man elected, not from Massachusetts or the Virginia Planner Elite. He's one of us. Ready for the next slide? And one of the first things he had to do was basically he had to face that for the past 23 years, Republican Democrats had been in office. And he needed to get rid of their support. So basically he says, I'm going to clean house, drain the swamp. You know, they've got to get rid of these politicians. And of course, everybody loves it. Oh, he's going to throw out all these. Well, in reality, guys, he only threw out about one fifth of the people. Okay, because you'd be surprised. Hi, you've been a Republican Democrat there for the past 23 years. You're really good at your job. I don't like you. Get out. Are you going to follow my way or are you going to follow the old way? My way? My way? My way? My way? You're out. My way, my way, my way, my way, you're out. Because the other people, you know, when they see these guys that have been there forever and are really good at their jobs, getting kicked to the street, they're like, I'll follow your way. And then to replace you, I bring in people, like she's from uh, New England, so I'm going to point her there. Uh, you're from the West, so I'm going to put you there. You're from, you know, the South, so I'm going to put you there making sure that all the regions were uh, similarly balanced. And, by the way, if anybody said, well, hey, President Jackson, she's not qualified. She, she doesn't know what, you know what I'd tell you? She, what do you mean she's not qualified? She's just as smart as all y'all. She's a common man. She's a common person. And that's what we need. Not these highfalutin fancy officials. We need more of you and me in there that know the true way. Yeah, and everybody, of course, loves that. And that's what we say about popularizing the office. Giving it to the popular, giving it to the populace. Not these experts, not these pie-in-the-sky, highfalutin professors. You and me can do it. But in reality, he's using political loyalty and usefulness. Making sure that all the different sections of America, north, south, and west, are well-balanced. And whereas most presidents have a cabinet meeting, that's not for Andy Jackson. Andy Jackson's thought about that is, who hired me to be the president? The American people hired me to be the president. In other words, they want me to lead. So he'd call like his Secretary of Defense, he'd call his Secretary of the Treasury, he'd call his Attorney General, call all these guys, and guys, where would they meet? In the White House. Where do you and your friends meet? The kitchen. Why? Hey, if you want food, it's right over there. If you want to drink, it's uh, you know, I'll talk around the kitchen table, maybe order a pizza, laugh, and you know, we'd say, hey, what do you think we ought to do about the Indian? And she'd say, well, this is what we need to do. And I'd be like, eh, okay, I'm still gonna do what I wanna do. What do you think we ought to do about the money? Well, this is what I, eh, okay, I'm still gonna do what I'm gonna do. Even though I'll listen to you. You know, just like a bunch of buds sitting around and talking together. Ready for the next slide? 
Now, the expansion of presidential power. For Andy Jackson, the president was the supreme power. And guys, he would not hesitate to use the army to get his way. <clears throat> he vetoed 12 bills during his administration. Now, vetoing 12 bills may not seem like a big deal, but guys, that was three more bills vetoed than all of his predecessors combined together had done. Okay? And as you should guess, his opponents are calling him King Andrew, born to command, had I been consulted, of veto memory, King Andrew I. And there's the Constitution of the United States ripped apart underneath his feet in the veto scepter. You ready? The reign of King Andrew. Okay, Jackson wanted reform in four different areas. Indian affairs, internal improvements, and land policy. Basically, the collection of revenue and enforcement of federal tax and the nation's banking system. We're going to talk about each one of these separately. The first one is Jackson and the Indians. Now, Americans saw Native Americans east of the Mississippi River as basically hindrances to their westward expansion. The five civilized tribes of the Cherokee, Seminole, Creek, Chickasaw, about 75,000 in total had large land holdings in Georgia, North South Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, and basically, the federal uh, government sent agents to make deals with them to try to get them to leave. And after the War of 1812, the government really pressured Indians to move west of the Mississippi River. This produced factionalism and con conflict within the tribes. So let's say y'all four people are all different tribes underneath the Yakimazoo Nation. Well, what we do is, hey, hey, she's the smallest and poorest tribe in the Yakima Zoo Nation. Hey, how's it going? Um, do you speak for everybody in your tribe? You could go, yeah. Hey, hey, um, we'll give you a lot of money for all your land. She goes, oh, okay. So basically, she's selling me out, selling me out, selling me out. You know, like, what? No, we didn't agree to, what? And she's me, <laughs> and of course, in the new land that y'all are going to get, west of the Mississippi River, she's going to get the best land. And you all are fighting amongst each other. Um, then at times, our president, Adams, he seemed to protect the Native Americans. Like, he was against this 1825 treaty called the Treaty of Indian Springs that was just, I mean, it was so obviously, fraudulently ripping off the Native Americans that Adams said, no, this, no, guys, not cool. Um, and of course, was that okay with the Americans that lived next to that land? No, because you had all these rumors of gold and rich soil. That's why they're, because they're paying off the government. They're using all their money. So instead of just moving over to their land, we're going to have to move hundreds of miles away and never see our relations again. So these guys basically go in and they start just taking the land of the Winnebago. And at the end, basically, Adams had to support the settlers because they were doing it anyway. Ready for the next slide? All right. And Jackson's policy was to aggressively move all Native Americans west of the Mississippi River. Now remember, he, Jackson had made alliances with a lot of these tribes during the War of 1812. Jackson had adopted 
a Cherokee uh, boy as one of his sons. Basically, with the Indian Removal Act of 1830, it pretty much gave the federal agents unlimited monies. Yeah, sure. And of course, he also wouldn't hesitate to use military force. For example, up in uh, Illinois with the Black Hawk War, because basically what the Native Americans do is they live on land seasonally. So like spring, we'd live on this part of the land. In the fall, we'd move to this part of the land. Well, the American Indian agents go out to talk to them when they're getting ready to leave, and the American Indian agents were like, hey, can we buy your land from you? And they're like, sure, we're getting ready to move. We're going to come back in the spring, but you can buy it from us. And they paid them. Well, when spring came around, they moved back. And they, they were like, oh, that's our land. So the state militia of Illinois gets called up. And Abraham Lincoln actually was part of the militia that went up and kicked the Black Hawks off their land. Now it's my peeps, yo. The Cherokee. Uh, he was just as aggressive against the Cherokee, a tribe he had made an alliance with in the War of 1812. By the 1820s, the Cherokee had developed a formal government, complete with a bicameral legislature, a court system, a professional civil service, by 1827, they had drafted their own constitution, published their own newspaper and alphabet, had been uh, developed for them by Sequoia. So guys, they were playing the American game and they were winning, they were flourishing. Some of them had slaves, other people wanted their land. Only problem was, according to the old constitutions and everything, you couldn't do it. Well, Georgia fixed the workaround, and in 1828, the Georgia legislature boop, said we're going to get rid of the old state constitution, and we're writing a new one. And basically, they wrote a new state constitution that stripped the Cherokee of a lot of their rights. The Cherokee, trying to play the American game, said, okay, we're going to sue the state of Georgia. So the Cherokee as a nation sues the state of Georgia. It gets all the way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, John Marshall says, guys, 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 we can't do nation against nation. That's not what this court is for. So the Cherokee aren't stupid. They say okay, and they have a mass lawsuit. Worcester v. Georgia, where Worcester is the most aggrieved. He's, and then you have all the other litigants that are placed below him. Okay? And that goes to the Supreme Court of the United States of America. And the case is heard by Chief Justice John Marshall. And he says, um, he says basically that uh, they had no right to limit their freedoms. So guys, basically the Cherokees won, right? Well, Andy Jackson said, John Marshall has made his decision. Now let's see him enforce it. Basically, he goes in, totally breaking uh, what the Supreme Court said, and he makes the Treaty of New Ashota, where they move basically the Native Americans and their land. Here's the Cherokee land. There's the Choctaw. There's the Sauk. There's a, well, this 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 one right here. The Seminole actually weren't defeated, so that's wrong. But here's and actually the Cherokee had more land over here, but I'm not getting into those things. Um, and the first people that were actually moved out were the Choctaw, not the Cherokee. But it happened to multiple tribes. And guys, this wasn't just like, okay, we're going to Oklahoma. And everybody went and walked in, straight trip Oklahoma. Okay, that was only three months. Oh my God. Actually, the way it happened is, okay, we're going to this fort. Okay, now we're going to this fort. Okay. Guys, their wandering took as much as two years before they finally got to their land. And during that journey, a quarter of the 20,000 Cherokee die. And guys, we have no numbers on how many slaves died. Because they didn't keep track of that. And that's why every year at the Cherokee Na at the uh, Independence Parade of the Cherokee out at Tahlequah, they have a contingent of the freedmen 
that are representing the nation as well. Now we get to the Seminole. The Seminole were a tribe down in Florida. The Seminole basically escaped slaves from like Georgia, North South Carolina, what would become Alabama, as they were coming down. The Seminole would let them come into their tribe. They didn't care. Sure, you can be a member. And so their numbers grew. And Osceola was the name of their chief. The U.S. went down there in 1830 and said, hi guys, this is our land. You need to get out. And the Seminole said, nope. And remember, they're in the Florida swamps. So basically, a war started with the Seminole. That was a guerrilla war. Uh, and it lasted for uh, 12 years, not ending until 1842. During that time, more than 1,500 U.S. soldiers are killed. And finally, the U.S. says, you know, it's just worthless swampland, and they left. Now, descendants of some of the slaves that moved into the uh, Seminole tribe later on during the 1880s uh, were integrated into the U.S. or were, became a part, even though in segregated units, of the um, U.S. Cavalry, known as the Buffalo Soldiers, that trained out uh, Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio. And they were known as some of the fiercest, most kick-butt uh, special force unit at that time. Ready for the next slide? Okay, we'll talk about that next time. It's Friday, let's celebrate. You want to get the lights? Remember guys, you got that dance thing up on campus today. Uh, if you're interested in that, click on the link, sign up, it's free. Uh, not only is the Colin College Dancers troop going to be there, but so are some uh, special guests from like the University of Oklahoma. Next week we got like the Jazzette, so if you're interested in that kind of music, just look at them. Once again, it's all free. And I think that, I think, I'm not sure, but I think they might be doing that da dance thing tomorrow as well. And I believe one show starts at like 7, but I think another show starts at like 5. I really want to be canceled. Hey, how did JV do? You beat him? Yeah. Y'all played a, uh, oh, what is that in Flower Mound? Yeah, y'all whooped him? Um, we need a bike. Hey, that's no, five. Oh, great. I heard the varsity didn't do so hard. <laughs> what what happened? I mean, where's, where's the, where's the,